be seen it. So, right off the bat, I can see a lot of you are a little bit confused that I am not Michelle. <laughs> and uh, we did that on purpose to kind of switch it up a bit. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm so privileged to be here today to share with you. So yes, I am going to stay here. <laughs> I'm not introducing Michelle. Oh, I got some fans over here. Anyways, but um, so it's great to be with family today. Amen. Um, my heart was bursting with excitement. You know, they told me, okay, you're going to go talk to Scarborough. I don't always get to come here, if you notice. But uh, my heart is really for family. And each one of you is a part of the family. And uh, I'm so excited to be able to share with you today. So, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Paul Berenger. And I come from our CLC Brampton satellite. So, way back in Brampton, probably like five hours away. <laughs> I'm joking, it's only an hour away. Um, is it an hour? 45 minutes away. But, let me just tell you about myself. So, I was born in a Christian home, um, and I've been a Christian practically for all my life. So, I came to know the Lord, I think it was when I was six or seven, when you could fully understand. And I gave my life to Christ, and then from then on till now, I've been passionately serving God, falling in love with Christ. And for those of you who think, let me, let me just clear this up. So, if I look really familiar, but like an older version, <laughs> You guys get where I'm going here? So if I, if I look like, if you're like, I've seen that guy before, but he's, he looks older. But like, I look young now, but like, I've seen him before, like in an older version. That's because I am Pastor Jerry's son. So just to clear that up, yes, I know that I look like him first. So you don't have to tell me after you look so much like your dad. Um, but, you know, a lot of people think about pastor's kids and they're just like, oh, pastor's kids. There's a, there's a stigma about them, oh, they're rebellious, they're, they, they don't want to be a part of the church, but I count it a privilege to be a pastor's kid, because, you know, I've grown up in a God-fearing home where I can see firsthand the move and the realness of God every day, you know, and there's not a lot of people who can say that, so I, I feel so blessed. Uh, my parents right now are in Calgary. I know they send their greetings to you guys, um, and so I just really want to show that, you know, I'm a part of your family, you're a part of my family, and today I just want to share what's on my heart. So throughout my Christian walk, I can tell you all the ministries I've been a part of, uh, praise and worship, young adults, I can tell you all the initiatives I've been a part of, and I can tell you like all the things that I've seen, all, all the places where I've gone, all the places my dad's brought me and I've seen, but I can sum that all up in one thing, that I am a son, and I love my father's business. You know, and, and that's, wow, this is, this is cool. Uh, so, <laughs> that I'm a son and I love my father's business, and that's really who I identify with, you know. All those things, all the things that we do, all the things that, the ministries that we're part of, it's not, I don't do them because I, I, I want to do them, but I do them because I'm a son. And you know, and, and it's my father's heart that I go after. So, when I talk about my father, I don't necessarily mean my dad, but I talk about, I'm talking about the Heavenly Father. So, God has been really working in my life these past two years. You know, really testing my character, really molding me, really working out the grit and the grime in my life over these past two years. Uh, last year was our first leadership training school uh, with the young adults, and the L5 and the leadership, they really came in, sat us down, and poured into our lives, you know, and really tried to mentor us and deal with the different things in our life. And you know, that, that time really affected me. It really challenged who I was. And some of the young adults are here today. I, I, brought, I brought them as my personal amen team, you know. Like, I was like, okay, like, if it gets quiet, and then if there's no one saying amen, like, I'm going to be like, amen, All right? I'm just kidding. Um, so it's... This leadership training school, what I was telling you about, it really challenged me. And you know, it's funny that, you know, I, like I told you, I've been growing up in a Christian home. I came to know the Lord. I've seen firsthand God's move. All these years, up to now, I'm, I'm 23 years old. And I've seen it all happen, but there were kingdom truths in my life that I wasn't applying. You know, there's things that, that God intended me to walk in, and I wasn't walking in it. 
And it, was, it came to the point, you know, you come so far along your Christianity, you're like, okay, I know how this goes. It's a well-oiled machine. Like, I know exactly, like, okay, I'm called to do this, I'm called to do that. But there are things in my life that God was dealing with, with me in that training school, and I was just mind-blown because I was like, all these years, I know I'm only 23, you guys are like, oh, all these years. But all these years of my Christian walk, there were kingdom truths that I didn't even know of, that I wasn't even walking in. So today, I, I just want to share a little bit about what I was taught. You know, the message that I'm going to share with you today is, is something that we were taught in our leadership training school, and God has really pressed it on me, and really, uh, when I was meditating on what to share today, He was really pouring this into my life, and it's really been something that we've been walking. So. That's really what I want to do today, is just to share my heart. Is that okay? Yeah? No one's going to throw tomatoes or... So, before I start, I want to thank the L5 and the leadership team for allowing me to speak. You know, I'm 23 years old and I'm on the pulpit. <laughs> and, and, and that I really want to thank them for that, for allowing me to come and share my heart. So today I want to tell you that God has a massive heart for the nations. And His heart burns for His children. I want to share you today the kingdom truths and how God intends to reach the nations. You know, and, and I, my heart is that you don't just hear what I say, but you catch who I am. So before we start, let's, let's just pray and offer this to God. Father, I thank you, God, that you are a source and sustainer. And that, Lord, through you, you give life and life abundantly. I pray, Jesus, today that as I speak, that your words would come out of me. Lord, that as they see me, they see you. Father, I just ask that every, every ear be uh, open today, every heart be prepared for what you're doing, Lord. We want transformation today. We don't want to leave the same. We just thank you and we bless you. We're excited for what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so if you have your Bible today, uh, let's turn to Matthew 13. We're going to look at two parables. Everyone say two parables. So if I've only done the first one, you know there's another one coming. <laughs> so, we're going to look at two parables. Who has heard the parable of the sower? Raise your hands. Anyone? Yeah? Parable of the sower. Okay, so we're going to go over that. And then we're going to go over the parable of the wheat and the tares. Or the wheat and the weeds. Who has heard that parable? Yeah? So, it's okay if you have raised your hand for the second one. I didn't know about it too. But today we're going to really look at both of them together. So, everyone say together. Yeah. So, we're going to look at the parable of the sower and the parable of the wheat and the tares, and we're going to look at them together. Because Jesus actually intended for these two parables to be taught together. And so many times we do one parable, parable of the soul is really well known, and then we stop. So today, uh, I'm really, we're going to really dig deep into the Word. Uh, I know Pastor Roy preaches here a lot, and he digs really deep. I'm not going to dig that deep, so... <laughs> I know you guys can take it, right? So we're going to look at these two parables. So let's turn to Matthew 13. So we're going to go 3 to 9. And then after we're going to go 18 to 23. So for those of you who, who don't know the parables, just to give you a little bit of pretext to this. Um, Jesus was in the house and then he, he went and sat by the lake. And large crowds, they came and they gathered. You know, and Jesus took this opportunity to speak about the kingdom. And he did this by using parables. So these are like stories on how he could uh, relate the kingdom into like natural things. So he did that to prepare the people because you can't just come out and be like, the kingdom of God is... It's, it was too confusing. So he told the disciples, I'm going to tell stories because that's what really will prepare them and, and, and turn their ear. So let's turn to Matthew 13 verse 3. Then we're going to read to 9. So does everyone have it? Yeah? Cool. We got it on the screen. Nice. Okay, so it says, Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang it quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop. A hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. 
So that's kind of the first parable. Jesus goes and says that, and then we're all like, great, but what does that mean? Right, so then Jesus goes to explain it again. He jumps to verse 18. So we're going to go verse 18 to 23. And in verse 18, he says, Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word. But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. So, Jesus, Jesus took the liberty to explain this to us because it's very confusing sometimes all the parables and, and, and the things he says. So, let's dig deep and kind of pause right here and look into what he's saying. So, the big picture here is a farmer sowing a seed, right? And there's kind of three outcomes of what happens. One is snatched away along the path. Another one falls and has, another one grows, but it has no root. Another one is choked, and so it, it grows, but then it's choked. And then the, the last one is a seed that is planted on good soil. So is everybody with me? Do you agree on that? So let's ask the question, who here is the sower? So, like, let's make this interactive. <laughs> so, if, if we're looking at this passage, we have the farmer, we have all these things. Who here is the sower? So, the answer to this question is that it does not say. So, it was a trick question. Got you guys. Yeah, great. So, <laughs> no more tricks. Okay, so it does not say. But we know who the sower is by looking at the seed. Right? It makes sense because we'll know who's sowing the seed if we know what the seed is. So what is the seed in the parable? If we're looking at it in verse 19, it says the seed is the message of the kingdom or the word of God. So the seed is the message of the kingdom or the word of God. So that's in verse 19. So if we know that the seed is the message of the kingdom or the word of God, who is the sower? It's anyone. Anyone can be a sower. It could be your pastor, the Holy Spirit, it could be a teacher, friend. Anyone who sows into your life the word of God or the word of the kingdom, they're the sower. Are we good? Amen. Yeah? Can I, can I get a louder? Amen. Are we good? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. So let's, last, let's, let, let's now look at the soil. So what is the soil? The Bible says that when someone hears it and understands it, then they, they have good soil. So we can agree that the soil is the readiness or preparedness of someone's heart to receive the word. Amen? Amen? Amen. Good. So if we look at all these parts, we have three parts, one, two, three. And we can say Jesus, I'm not Jesus, we can say that the sower is anyone who sows the good, the word of the kingdom, or the word of God, right? And the soil is the readiness of our hearts. So in this parable, Jesus say, is saying that the fruit that comes from the Word of God that is sown in our lives is fully dependent on the readiness and condition in our lives, of our hearts. Amen? So Jesus is saying that the fruit that comes from the Word of God that is sown in our lives is fully dependent on the readiness and condition of our hearts. Amen? So... The word that I'm speaking to you today will be heard by everyone. Everyone's hearing it, right? But depending on everyone's heart, different outcomes will happen. Right? Someone can hear this word and just dismiss it. Just like the word that falls on the path and is snatched away by the birds. Another person can hear the word and, and accept it and be on fire for a short time and then after loses the word when worry comes. 
and the, and the troubles of the world come. Another person could hear it and you know it gets choked because you start thinking about all these problems in your life and, and you don't really accept it so that there's no fruit that comes from it. And the last person hears it and understands it and that person can transform nations. Amen? So, I'm not going to spend too much time on this parable because it's a, it's a really known parable. But we can all agree that this parable is about self-transformation. It's about looking at ourselves and knowing the conditions of our hearts and allowing the Word to transform us so that we bear fruit. Amen? So, I'm going to stop here with that parable. So, that's, does everyone understand the parable of the sower? Very clear? Straight? Okay. So now many people stop at the parable of the sower. And they're like, okay, amen, I'm blessed. I'm going to go. And really when Jesus was preaching this, there, there was another parable that was supposed to be taught with the parable of the sower. And, and that parable is the parable of the wheat and the tares. Of the wheat and the weeds. So we're going to look at Matthew 13. So same chapter, but let's... Go to verse 24. We're going to go 24 to 29. Alright? So, is everyone there? Amen. So, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed seeds among the wheat and went away. When wheat sprouted and formed heads... Then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go up and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, First, collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it to my barn. So that's the parable of the wheat and the tares. So, how many people are confused after reading that? I was confused. Because I was like, okay, that's great. Parable. A, a farmer goes into the field, sows seed again. So, the great thing is that we have the disciples, amen? Because the disciples were a lot like us, confused. <laughs> so sometimes I read the Bible and I'm like, thank God for the disciples because they ask the, the questions, you know? Because <laughs> I'm in the same boat and I'm like, I could easily be like, I get it, amen. But the disciples were like, what is going on? So they pressed in. You know, Jesus sometimes, he, he has these mysteries of the kingdom and it's up to us to press in. Amen? It's up to us to ask the questions and be like, okay, this is the parable of wheat and the tears. Like, what does that mean? So they did that. So we're going to go to verse 36, and then we're going to read to 43. So then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. And the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. And the harvesters are angels. Verse 40. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will weed out His kingdom, everything that causes sin in all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace, where, they will be, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The kingdom of the Father, whoever has ears, let them hear. So, now we have a different story. Same kind of elements, do you agree, as the parable of the sower. We have the seed, we have a farmer, we have the field. But now Jesus is saying it in a different way. So overall, if we look at the big picture, we can see that there's a farmer who sows seed in his field. And then his enemy comes 
and sows in wheat. And, and Jesus says that the farmer allows them to both grow until a time of harvest where both are uprooted and the, the weeds get burned and the wheat gets put into the barn. So our, our, do we get that? So now we are, we got to ask ourselves the same questions. Asking ourselves and digging deep to, okay, what is this parable? Who is the sower? What is the field? What is Jesus really trying to say? So if we step back, who is the sower in this parable? If, if we're looking at the parable of the wheat and the tares. Jesus. I hear like, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It says clearly in verse 37. So the sower is the son of man, which is Jesus. Men, we got that? Are you all with me? I don't know if preaching before lunch or after lunch is like, which one's worse? <laughs> So, so, the sower is Jesus, right? What is the field? The world. Thank you. In verse 38, it says the world. And what is the seed? So it says in verse 38, the field is the world and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom or the children of the kingdom. And if we translate that back in the Greek, it says, The good seed stands for the huios, the mature, complete, lacking nothing, sons of God. So, if we bring that back, if we're looking at who, who the seed is, the seed is you. The seed is me. Turn to your neighbor and say, the seed is you. Does that make sense? You are the seed. Let's change that. <laughs> you are the seed. So, before we get excited and say, okay, I'm the seed, yay, what does that mean? <laughs> let's, let's take it back a notch. There's one key detail that we're missing. It says God wants to show the huios of God, the sons, the mature sons. You see, there's a natural progression as we come into Christianity. We, we go from different stages. We, we come in, we accept the Lord, and we're babies in Christ. Right? And then we continue to grow on, and we, go, we, we become napios, which is a baby, and then we get nurtured and developed, and we move through the stages of sonship, and we go from napios, then we go to, we go pedion, technon, neoniscus, and then we get to the point that we're fully mature, and we are the huios of God. So, God does not want to sow the napios, the baby, he doesn't want to sow the Padeon. Doesn't even want to sow the, the Neoniscos, which is close, but he wants to sow the Huios. So, before we get excited, we need to understand that God wants us, He wants to sow us at this stage. And to be honest with you, like many of us aren't at this stage. So God wants to build us to a point where we're built up, we are built up and raised us to a point where we are us so that we can be sown into the world. Amen? So Jesus is the good, is the sower. And He wants to sow us into the field, which is the world. Parable of the wheat and the tears. Do we get it? Do we get it? So we have two parables now. And you're kind of like, what? <laughs> So like I said, most people stop at the parable of the sower, but they don't realize that there's a bigger picture here that Jesus wanted to, to preach. And we have the parable of the wheat of the tears on this side, and, and now we're, we're asking Jesus, Jesus, how do these come together? So we have the parable of the sower, which speaks of self-transformation, right? Then we have the parable of the wheat and the tares, which speaks of the kingdom of God and sowing of sons to transform the nations. Right? And we have these two parables. So how do they connect? What did Jesus intend for these parables? So I'm going to lay it out for you. So try to stay with me. Everyone say, stay with me. Stay with me. I say it again. Stay with me. Stay with me. Okay. So first... Is everyone with me? Yeah? Every ear? Every tongue? Every... 
The Word of God is sown into our hearts, right? Depending on the soil, it transforms us from the top down, inside out, and we begin to grow, right? That's the parable of the sower. We then are constantly growing, and fruit is coming from, from the Word sown into our lives until we reach the point of maturity, when we are fully grown, complete, lacking nothing. Then Jesus sows us as mature sons into the nations. So let's, let's, let's do that again. So the Word of God is sown into our hearts. Depending on our soil, it transforms us from the top down, inside out. And we begin to grow. It's the parable of the sower. We then are constantly growing. And fruit is coming from the Word sown into our lives. Until we reach the point of maturity. Huios. Complete, lacking nothing. Fully grown. Then Jesus sows that person, that son, into the nations. You see, the parables outline how we must first be transformed and then submit to a process until we are released to the nations. You guys, are you with me? So, so many times we, we stop at the first parable and we don't see the bigger picture. That God wants to transform you for the nations. Yes, right. That God wants to build you up for the nations. Because He wants to sow you into the nations. You see, the connections between the two parables is maturity. Yes. And sonship. The connections between the parable of the sower and the parable of the wheat and the tears is maturity. And that's how they line up. You see, friends, there was a call for us to mature and undergo the process of sonship because the nations need mature sons. Amen? Amen? In the wheat of the parable, in the, in the parable of the wheat and the tares, it speaks of God's desire for those that are mature to be sown. Why? Why do I have to be mature? To be sown into the world. Because it is the mature that accurately represent and reflect the Father. It is the mature who accurately represent and reflect the Father. Through them, the nations will see the kingdom of, the, of God. Through them, they'll know the Father. Through them, they'll see God's love. Through them, they'll see prosperity, blessing, abundance. Through them, they'll see life. But it needs to be accurate. You see, God is not so looking to sow baby Christians, but mature sons. So let's, let's compare this to the physical. So I'm going to do a little bit of an example here, my first illustration. Um, so if, if I was to do this, so, so if I was to take a baby, I'm not going to take your babies. <laughs> just, just saying. If I was to take a baby and put him in a room full of strangers... Just, his parents aren't there, his or her parents are there, it's just a baby in a room full of strangers. If I was to ask you, tell me the character of their parents, what are you going to say? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. He's a baby. Yeah. I don't, I, I can't make any judgments on that. I, I can't tell you about their parents because it's just a baby. If I was to do the same thing with a teenager, take a random teenager, put him into a room, and say, tell me about his parents. And, you know, some people are like, oh, that could work. Like, I raised my children so well. What, what if that teenager had his girlfriend break up with him just right before? <laughs> Crying, you know, some of them are, like, in a, a drug. Some of them are doing all these things the parents don't really know about. Can you 100% say that you know the character of their parents? Can you 100% say, No. Because they're still wavering, they're still trying to figure out things. They're still going about doing different things. So you can't really say that. But if I was to put a mature son in a room, and I was to say, someone who, who doesn't care if they're tired, you know, will act the same way, will be polite, will have life in them. It doesn't matter what happened. 
It doesn't matter if, you know, they're, they have no money. It doesn't matter all these things. But I put them in the room and, and they're conducting themselves in a way that, that has life and, and, and there's such a, a good character in them. 100% you could see that they were raised well. That, that, that somebody nurtured them and, and brought them to a point where they could face any adversity and trials and, and their character will stay the same. In the same way, God desires for an accurate reflection of Him in a world where He's not physically present. It's for them to see us and know the Father. You know, I, I have the privilege of serving on the worship team uh, probably for like a decade now <laughs> or more. But I, I get to work with a lot of different bands and, and some of the bands that come in, like the egos that they have, just like, like, oh, I'm the worship leader. <laughs> be blessed, what are you saying? Just the, just the egos and like all these different things that they have. And the first thing I think of in my mind is, did your, did your leadership know this? Did they raise you like this? Who, 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 who told you this was okay? You know, who, who kind of nurtured you like this? That you could come in and think that, you know, this is about me and all that stuff. You see, there's, there's a natural kind of connection that we do. Whenever you see someone, you, you correlate it to whoever raised them. You correlate it to how they were raised up and, and the circumstances in their lives. So that's why God wants us to be accurate reflections of Him, because He doesn't want to be misrepresented. misrepresented. God's desire for us as Christians is to be fully grown and founded on kingdom principles, that we don't sway to the right or to the left, but are secure in our faith, with our actions demonstrating the heart of the Father. Many people will never read the Bible or go to church, like a church building. It is up to us as sons to share the good news, but also show them who the Father is in our lives. How many Christians today are misrepresenting the Father? You know, my heart aches because the lost dismisses Christianity because they do not see the true love of God. They do not see life, but they see dead religion. They see compromise, doubt, and fear, worry. Right. But that's not God. You see, the Bible says in Romans 8, 19, For the creation waits, waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Amen. They are longing and eager for true representations of the Father. They want to know Him. They want to see Him. We know Him. And it's up to us to represent Him. So I, I've been saying all these things and saying we need to mature. We need to go from here to here. But how do we mature? How do I do it, Paul? I, I'm with you, but how do, I, how do I mature? And the answer is simple. We need to embrace the process of sonship discipleship. We need to allow authority in our lives, the fathers and the mothers in our house, to come and walk with us. What baby does not need nurturing? What teenager does not need guidance? In this, yet in the spiritual, we let the babies go. We let the teenagers in the spirit, in, in, in the spiritual just do what they want. You know, that was a big testimony for me. I, uh, I went to really, uh, one of the top business schools in Canada, you know, was really passionate, wanted to like, really go after business and do all these things. And there comes a point where you just have so much pride, you know, and you think you know it. You're like, yeah, I know it. Like, I know my stuff, I'm educated, I'm young, I, I, I know it better than you. So it comes to a point where it's hard to submit. And like I was telling you, God really dealt with that in my life. That, you know, you think you know, but these leaders are there to walk with you. They're to teach you. Yes, you may have a gifting, but how's your character? You know? So 
We need, to, we need to willingly arrange ourselves under the mothers and daughters in this house. Even when we don't agree. I can tell you, me and my dad, sometimes we butt heads. Sometimes. But at the end of the day, my heart is always to submit to him. You know? It's, it's to teach us, to correct us, to walk, along, to walk alongside us. For us to go through tr testings and trials to build a character, to receive love, a correction in love, to deal with the brokenness before we go out into the world. To deal with the issues that I have with, with pride or jealousy or, or lust, all these things, to deal with it before I go out and represent Christ. You know, if we look at Jesus' life, we can see that he submitted to his parents for many years until he was released and sown into the world. In Luke 2, 51, it says, Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. From the age of 12 until 30, that's all it said about Jesus. That he grew in wisdom, stature, and favor. Nothing was said but that he submitted to Mary and Joseph. It's that process. Those years where he, he, he dealt with things in his life. And it wasn't until, so if we go to Matthew 3.17, when Jesus was revealed and, and God said, This is my son whom I love, who I am well pleased. What a powerful thing. For Jesus was sown into the world as a son. A mature son. He wasn't introduced as a prophet, teacher, or an evangelist. This is my great prophet. But he was introduced as a son. Jesus went through testing and trials. But through it all accurately displayed the heart of the Father. Jesus was able to go into the nations and bring transformation. He was able to do it. And he did it by just being who he was. And it didn't look religious. It wasn't a conference or like a big gathering where, or it wasn't in a church building. It was on the streets at the tables with sinners. Wherever Jesus went, the place was transformed because of who he was. He reflected the Father and brought life everywhere. Amen. People desired to know more and started to believe in God. And many times we go into these places and nothing happens. I go in there and I'm like, no transformation. We end up looking like the lost. So we become discouraged and we stay within the church walls. And, and sometimes we even go out, we end up being backsliding. Friends, Transformation isn't happening because of where you are. It's not happening because we have not come to the point where we are mature enough to be so. We have not gone through the process and developed and equipped ourselves. And we go into the world not having dealt with the issues and problems in our lives. And the world sees it and doesn't want it. it the disciples were just like Jesus. I love the disciples. You know... They went through the process of, of sonship too. When they followed Jesus, did he release them right away? No. They just literally followed him everywhere. They didn't do anything yet. They walked with him and observed him. Jesus brought correction to their lives and taught them closely. You know, receiving correction from Jesus, if you read the Bible, it's harsh. <laughs> <laughs> then he told Peter, he said, get, get behind me, Satan. Whoa. <laughs> Sorry, Jesus. Yeah. So, once they grew to a certain point, God released them to the nations, and look what happened. Yeah. We're standing here today because of them. Amen. Amen. There are countless accounts of sons who have submitted to the process, were sown and brought transformation. We can look at Timothy and Paul, Joshua and Moses, Isaac and Jacob, all these different accounts. We ask ourselves, how do I bring the kingdom? How do I do it? How do I, the kingdom needs to come on earth. Friends, God's way has been constantly repeated throughout the Bible. The sowing of mature sons who accurately represent and reflect Him. 
Friends, I say to you again, the nations need us to grow up. You know, and I'm saying this to myself too. Like, there's things in my life that I need to deal with, need to, need to work on. The marketplace, theater, neighbors, friends need us to grow up so that we can accurately demonstrate the Father to them. That they may taste and see His goodness. 99% of us won't be pastors. Do you agree? Do you want to come to church? <laughs> 99% of us won't be pastors or, or prophets. And that's okay. Because God needs us to be sown in all areas. He wants to bring the kingdom of God on earth in all areas. So it's wherever you are, God wants to use you there. If you're a dancer in theater, you know, if you're a nurse in the hospital, whoever you are, whatever you do, God wants to sow you right there. You know, we, we had the privilege, me and my sister, to talk to the London leaders, so our London family, uh, just this past weekend, so yesterday and Friday. And I was sharing to them, you know, yes, I'm a worship leader, for those I, I lead worship, but my coworkers won't see me singing. They won't see me playing my guitar, and they won't see me leading a ministry, they won't see me doing the sound, they won't see me doing ushering or teaching the kids. They see who I am every day. That's who my coworkers see. I want to I talk about my sister. She doesn't know I'm always going to talk about her. So uh, uh, I want to talk about Michelle. So I'm going to lay out the juicy stuff. I'm joking. It's not going to happen. So how many of you follow Michelle on Instagram or Twitter or that, that account? Oh, there we go. One fan. Two, two fans. Everyone's like, yes, I follow her. And anyways, um, so if you look at her life, her life is full of adventures. You know, life and people are drawn to it, right? You look at her profile and you're like, wow, this awesome life she lives. I think, I think she told me one time her coworkers were like so in awe of like her life and like traveling and all this stuff. And you know, they don't hear her preach. Let me say that again, they don't hear her preach. We hear her preach and we're like, awesome, Michelle, Michelle, Michelle. <laughs> But the people around her are drawn to her because they see God. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And she accurately represents and reflects Him because she's gone through the process. And she's dealt with the things in her life. She used to beat me up all the time. <laughs> We're going to open the altar and let me just get saved from that. <laughs> she, she, no, seriously. You see Michelle's fruit now because of the process. Even in my own life, you know, I'm released to do many things. Young adults, ministry, praise and worship ministry. And it wasn't until years of submitting to the fathers and mothers in my life. You know, Pastor Dora in April, Michelle, Pastor Jerry and Elby, Sister Christian. Or my character and my heart will be tested before I can be released to handle more things. You know, and I, I praise God for these fathers and mothers because they walk with me. They keep me accountable. You know, they, they even prayed for me like before I came here. Like, oh, Paul, go do a good job. We pray for you. And I know they're praying for me right now. It's such a beautiful and necessary thing to be raised up as a son. So my question to you is how are you developing and growing up in sonship? Who are your spiritual mothers and fathers? If we can only understand that the nations and all of creation eagerly await for us, that God wants to sow His kingdom through us. This was the plan for the lost, for us to demonstrate His love in his heart to them through us. If preaching and teaching alone could change nations, how come we don't see revival? It's about who we are and the fruit of our lives. Don't get me wrong, we do need to share the gospel. 
And we are called to share the good news. But that must align with who we are. You know, God is not just developing us for us. Or, you know, we might think God is developing my leadership skills for this church. He's developing you for the nations. That's why the parables need to be put together because it's not just about this small thing. But He's transforming us for the nations. You know, at the beginning I told you I wanted to share you to share to you God's strategy for reaching the nations. God's desire is to sow me and you. Mature sons to the nations. And when I say nations, don't get me wrong. Nations are your neighbors. Nations are your co-workers. Nations are your friends and your family. Those are the nations. Sometimes we think, I remember I used to think, like nations would be me traveling to like Africa and like, yeah, the nations. We're traveling different places and being like, ah. But the nations are my coworkers. Do they see God in me? Or do they see my brokenness? Am I walking with someone to deal with that stuff? You know, and when I'm talking about sonship, I'm not talking about just in the physical. Many of us are still at the Napios stage, are still babies in our faith. It doesn't matter what age. Are we moving, maturing, going through the process? Every son needs a father. Every son needs a father. So we need to willingly arrange ourselves, submit to teach and correct us, to go through testing and trials. And I, I say it like that, like testing and trials, because it's hard, it's really hard. You know, if I had it my way, I wouldn't be speaking to you today. And let, I want to be real with you guys. I want to be standing on this pulpit talking to you. If I had it my way. But his way is greater. It's because of his way and how my, my fathers and mothers have brought me up and encouraged me and, and worked in my life doing all these different things that I can be released at this point. I just want to hit home to you that it's real. It's not a whoo kind of thing. It's every day, it's the struggle. If, if you're young, the struggle's real. If you're old, you can use it too. But, <laughs> but it's that walk with God, constantly being tested and then things being cut off, being put to the fire, and then things being, um, being pruned and, and, and really being molded so that we can accurately reflect and represent Him. Why? Because it's what the nations need. Ask yourself, when you, when you go into your workplace, do you bring transformation? When you go into your school, do people see God? Or do they see brokenness? And I just want to call up the worship team as, a, as I end. You know, if Jesus had to go through the process, what more us? If Jesus, all God, had to go through this process where He had to be developed and submitted, what more of us? You know, this house is full of mothers and fathers that care for every one of you. You know, and I just want to hit home that it's not necessarily age. You know, I'm, I'm mentoring someone who's well over the age of me. You know, but it comes to the point where you humble yourself. And you realize where you are and you shout and say, can, you, can we deal with this together? I'm going through these things. Can we walk together? Can you help me? Can we, can we, can we walk to, alongside each other? Friends, His heart is for us. Amen. 
And I want to open up the altar and allow you to respond to his call. You know, you may be like me, someone who is constantly battling with sonship. Is it worth it? Is it not worth it? You may have that pride in your life where you're saying, you know, I want it my way. I want it, I want it, I want it to be my way. Why, did, why do I have to submit? Why do I have to deal with these things? You know, but today is about submitting your will. But today is about knowing God's heart and saying, God, I want it your way. That I'm willing to go through this process. That I'm willing to, for you to deal with these hard things in my life so that I may accurately represent and reflect you. So that the nations may see me and see you. I know that sonship was taught here a lot of times. And I know that it's constantly been a message and message. But today, it's about deciding in your heart that we're going to go through it. That you're going to go through this process. That no matter what it takes, I'm, I'm going to go through the process. Because the nations need us. The nations need you. Your friends, your family, co-workers, neighbors, they need us. But I don't want to misrepresent God. He's too good. God is just too good for me to mess up His image. So today I, I I want to open the altar. I brought um, some of our leaders from our leadership training school to, to lay hands. And I know that L5 is going to help to pray for people. But really ask yourself, have I been doing it my way? Now is the time where we can surrender to Him. We can posture our hearts and say, I have good soil. God bless you as you come. Thank you. 